Morning, how are we doing? Alright, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, my name is Pastor Justin. I'm Pastor down at Redeemer Bible Church in Elk Grove. And uh, it's good to be here. Um, it's been a while. Um, I, didn't make, I didn't make the cut for a few years, but now I'm getting the cut for the back Friday morning. So it's good to, it's good to be here. Um, thankful. Thankful for UGM. Thankful for how God uses it to transform lives. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, this morning, um, we're going to be in Romans 12. So if you've got a Bible, I want you to go there. I want you to see God's words, not my words. Um, I want you to know that this is what God says, not some random guy on Friday morning. Um, because actually, God's word changes our lives, not man's words. Um, man's words have no power. God's words have power. Um, and so we need to go back and see what God says, all right? Um, would you pray as we get started? I want us to ask God for help. Father, this morning, um, some of us maybe didn't sleep great last night. Some of us maybe wish we were still sleeping. Um, Lord, I don't know most everybody in this room, but you do. Father, uh, I know that in this room, there's a lot of heavy hearts. There's a lot of trials. There's a lot of pain and suffering. Um, Sometimes because we've done sinful things and other times because somebody sinned against us. Um, maybe we just have pain and suffering because this world's broken with disease and illness. Uh, but God, we, we, uh, life is not always easy. Um, you are always good, but life is not always easy. And we need to learn how to live this life by faith um, in submission to you, walking in your ways. Uh, for Father, that is truly what but the Bible calls the blessed life, um, is when we are walking rightly with the God who made us. And so God, I pray that this morning, um, even though I don't know the hearts of every person here, you do, and would you speak uniquely to each person here, um, even if it's not what I think needs to be said, but maybe you know how to take your word and apply it to the heart and lives of each person and that we come away and say, wow, God, I, we've, we've heard from you this morning. Um, and we believe that, that you have met with us and you've cared for us, Lord. So please be gracious to us right now uh, because we need you, Father. I need you. Um, I can't change anybody's life. Um, that's way beyond my power. But you change lives all the time. And so for those of us who know you and those of us who don't know you yet, we all need your transforming grace more. And so, God, would you do that kind work this morning? Um, and in Christ's name, amen. 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 <clears throat> um, I, uh, I've been able to do mission work at a few different places in the world over the last 20 years. And um, uh, I, was, I actually did an internship for college. I was a music major, and so I had to do a music internship. And so I ended up going to uh, the Philippines, and I did a music internship. Super random. Um, but... I, I did this internship teaching music uh, at a college there for three months. Um, but that's not the story. The story is that the Philippines is known for bootleg everything, all right? Fake knockoffs, all right? So you have whole malls um, with fake, you name it, all right? One of my favorites was a pair of Jordan shoes, but Jordan's holding a spear. Um, you know, it was like, hey, you didn't, somebody didn't do a good job. Like, somebody in the factory, like, you know, messed up. Um, you know, and you just got everything. I mean, movies that haven't come out yet, they're out there. You know, somebody shot them in a theater somewhere and they're selling them, you know, real jewelry. You're like, yeah, right, it's a dollar, you know. I mean, but they're just notorious for, for bootlegging everything, right? Um, and uh, that's a silly story, but when I, when I come to the Word of God, and, and especially Romans chapter 12, um, I'm reminded of that because I think there's a lot of bootleg Christianity. It's, it's, it looks like Christian, but it's actually not. Um, and it's lost the power of the gospel because it's, ma it's a made-up version of Christianity. Um, and so I don't know all of your stories, um, but I'm sure you've been exposed to this bootleg Christianity. This idea that, oh yeah, we're religious, we have faith, um, and then maybe it didn't work. I mean, maybe you've said that, maybe you've heard that, like, yeah, I tried that, it didn't work. Um, and I'd say it's like trying a pair of Jordans when he's holding a spear. It's like, yeah, you didn't get the real deal. Like, you got something phony and fake and a knockoff. Um, and the Word of God, right, the book that we hold, the Bible, it actually explains and defines what real Christianity is. And we have to, we have to let God define who he is. We don't get to define God, faith, religion, Jesus, 
Um, and, and we're really good at that. We actually can make God after our terms, right? Like, we want God to be like this. Um, and maybe your version of God, like, he's just all loving. He would never hurt nobody. Like, well, actually, God does judge, God judges sin. It's all over the Bible. Uh, but we don't like that part, so we ignore that part, right? Or maybe we just like that God loves me just the way I am, and, and we don't like talking about consequences. Because how many of us like consequences? None of us, right? So we don't want to think about that. We're like, no, no, no. Just tell me how much God loves me, and, and I'll get my, my, my spiritual you know, booster shot on Sundays, and then I'll go do me the rest of the week, right? And it's like, well, ah, maybe, maybe I'm missing something. It's like, yeah, you're missing that God, God brings consequences or discipline right, to those he loves, right? So we got to let God define uh, even what it means to be people of faith. And I think Romans 12 is a great spot to go. So this morning, uh, I don't even know what time we got to finish here. Is it 9 o'clock, 8.50? 845? Oh, man. All right. Um, you know, pastors, we just don't like clocks. We just want to keep going. Um, so I'll try to wrap it up to 845. Romans is amazing. Um, I'm sure that, that you study Romans here in a variety of ways. Uh, I'm knowing our local churches. Romans is a great, a great book of the Bible um, for so many reasons. I think it explains the gospel, the good news of Jesus, better than any other singular book in the Bible. Actually, the, the apostle Paul that God used to write Romans, he starts off with literally in Romans 1, 5, saying, I'm writing this for the obedience of faith amongst the nations, that all people would know who God is and would know how to follow him. And that's the book of Romans. I mean, it's amazing. It's deep, it's complex, but it's beautiful. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's real good. Um, and so I don't have time this morning to preach all of Romans, but just to give you like a, a super 30,000 foot flyover, Romans chapter 1 and 2 and three is you're more wicked than you ever thought you were. I mean, isn't that good news for the morning? <laughs> you're way worse than you think you are. Like our opinions of ourselves are pretty high. I mean, how many of you ever thought, I just, I just can't forgive myself? <clears throat> Come on, raise your hands. Y'all should raise them. I can't forgive myself. You know, you know why we can't forgive ourselves? Because we actually think higher thoughts of ourselves than God does. When we screw up, God's like, yeah, that's called sin. I know. I knew you were going to do that. That's why I sent Jesus to die for you. And we're like, oh my gosh, I did what? I can't believe I did it again. And God's like, yeah, it's called sin. And Romans says you're dead in it. Isn't that good news? It's like, boy, oh boy, tell me that one again, right? It's like, no, you're worse than you ever thought you were. That's Romans 1, 2, and 3. You're a slave to sin. Like, that's a great Friday morning chapel so far, right? But that's, that's Romans 1, 2, and 3. But Romans 4 and 5 is like there is a God who is willing to justify you by faith. Amen. That you believe in him. He's I'm going to make you righteous. Not because you are righteous, but because Jesus was righteous. So I'm going to forgive you if you repent and believe the gospel. And I'm going to declare you to be righteous, which is crazy. Because I don't know about you, but like... Most people will say, you know, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a good person, or I'm an okay person, um, but I've never met anybody who actually says I'm a righteous person. I don't care if you're Mother Teresa. Ain't nobody saying they're a righteous person. Because we know that we're not, right? We know like that, yeah, righteous? Yeah, no, I've, I've done enough stuff in my life to know I'm not righteous. I may not as bad as that guy, but I'm not righteous. And Romans is four or five is like, no, no, in Christ, you are righteous. So there's the good news, right? It's like by faith, God takes you from being dead in your sins, lost, damned to hell for eternity, unrighteous to righteous by faith, right? And then we get to like Romans 6 and Romans 7, and in the 8, you get this idea that actually, even as Christians, we struggle with this thing called sin. If you're a Christian, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, you're like, all right, God, I do love you. I repented. I believe that I'm a Christian. But man, sin is still just knocking on my door, right? And so then Paul's getting this, the very thing I would, I hate, I'm doing it again, right? And it's like, why do I do the things that I hate? And he, he's just, oh, he feels wretched by the end of Romans 7. And so then he explo explodes with this idea of like, yeah, praise me to God through Jesus Christ, right? Our Lord, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's like my favorite verse in the Bible because we feel condemned, don't we? If we're just honest, well, I know we feel condemned. We've done, we've done stuff. We're like, Lord, oh, I'm a terrible person. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you are. <laughs> That's okay. Jesus died for you, and he says he took your condemnation, so there's no condemnation in Christ. It's amazing. And then really Romans 9, 10, and 11, 
Um, you get this glorious plan. You get kind of God. I think God zooms out and he says, I'm going to show you how, how I think about salvation. And he says, I'm gonna, I chose you from, from before the world began, which is crazy business, right? You're like, really, God, before you made everything, you knew exactly who was, who was going to run from you and who was going to be saved. And you, you chose me before the foundation of the world. That's just like salvation. God, God's work in your life is way bigger than you, right? God's not just up in heaven throwing the dice. Okay, that one, that one. No, this is God's eternal plan. Even for you to be here at UGM, right? It's like he knows what he's doing, that you would hear the gospel. He's like, yeah, I want you here. You thought it was about clean and sober. It's about Jesus Amen. and about you coming to know Jesus. Romans 9, 10, and 11 getting worked out right here in real time and space. Well, then we get to Romans 12, all right? And we're going to – and that was a real quick flyover. If you have any more questions, ask Victor. Um, <laughs> all right? So uh, – and if you want to know stories about Victor, ask, just, yeah. ask me because I've known this guy since he was like 15. Uh, that was pretty great. Um, and Jesus did, did, did change this guy too, which is awesome. Um, just like he's changed so many of us. Um, we get to Romans 12, all right? And the Apostle Paul is going to, he's going to kind of turn it now and go, okay, I've been telling you all about this glorious thing that God's done to save sinners, all right? And, and we can look at that and say, oh, wow, man, praise God. Oh, he loves me and Jesus died for me. And that's kind of, that's great. We need that. But sometimes we, we, we would ignore Romans 12, 1 and 2. Um, and I, I say, I call it this way. I think it's because we have selfish Christianity. We love to talk about what God does for us, but we don't want to talk about what we, what we do for God. Okay, just tell me how much God loves me. But don't tell me what, what I actually got to do with that, right? We just want to hear the tell me God loves me part. And then we want to go do us 24-7, 365. That's not, that's not how the Bible rolls at all. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. So I just want to break this down, all right? Real simple, we're gonna walk through, the, walk through the Bible, and I hope when we finish, you'd be like, you know what? I think I have a better understanding of Romans 12, one and two, and hopefully you'll be encouraged to live for God because of it, right? <laughs> so let's just walk through it and see what God has. The first thing we're gonna notice is, I appeal to you therefore, brothers. When you think of appeal, what comes to your mind? You can talk back. Court date. Court date. There we go. Yeah, it's a great example. Uh, you're making an appeal. All right? Somebody's, maybe you're like, man, I, there's the sentence or the verdict, and I'm going to appeal it, right? Yeah. And you're going to appeal it. You're going to be passionate. You're going to present your, you're going to present your case. You're going to make, hopefully you got a good lawyer, right? You're going to make an appeal because you want to win. You want the, you want something to turn into your favor. Here we see the apostle Paul saying, I appeal to you. This isn't just some casual, hey, hey, if you think about it, you should try this. It's not what's going on here. It's not, hey, here's a suggestion. Now, here's an appeal to you, Christian, and notice, notice how he says it, by the mercies of God. I love this because God's been merciful. That's the point. God's been merciful. You know what the mercy of God is? You don't get what you deserve. That's, that's mercy. <laughs> Right? That, that, that's, and it's all over our Bibles. God is merciful. Um, I got four children, and I try to teach them about God's justice. That's called spanking. All right? So they get corrected for their sin. But then I also try to teach them about God's mercy. So there's times I'll say, son, I got four boys. I'm going to show you mercy right now, which you deserve consequence, but I'm not going to give it to you. Because God shows mercy. The funny thing about that is the moment you teach them about mercy, what do they want every time? Mercy. <laughs> mercy. God, Dad, give me mercy. It's like, yeah, yeah, we ain't playing that game, right? Um, yeah, they, they know the system real, real early. Um, but the point here is you've been given the mercy of God. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you're tracking with Romans, Romans 1 through 11, you're like, oh my goodness. I deserve the wrath of God for all eternity, and I've been given the mercy of God for all eternity. For all eternity. It overwhelms you. You know you've been given mercy. And he says, I appeal to you, brothers, 
by the mercies of God that I've been telling you for 11 chapters. I've been exploding on his mercy. And I've been telling you all about the mercy of God, how good he is, how kind he is, how gracious he is, how long-suffering he is. Now I'm going to appeal to you passionately, strongly, by the mercies of God. You haven't gotten what you deserve. So now let me tell you how you have to respond to that mercy. And here's where I'm going to just reference back to counterfeit Christianity, right? Bootleg Christianity. There's a lot of Christian Christianity in the world, quote-unquote, that just says, you know what, just, just God loves you just the way you are and stay just the way you are. That's not how the Bible talks at all. <laughs> yeah, God loves you the way you are and he's going to change you into something that you're not. It's called new creation, right? He's going to take you from being your old man dead in your sins to a new creation in Christ. And if that, that new creation never comes, then we actually have to say, well, are you even, have you ever even been saved by his grace? Because the evidence, the proof, if you will, that you're actually born again, that you're a new bent, that you're new in Christ, that you received his mercy, is your life looks like it. So how does Paul describe it in these verses? Let's look at them. He says, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now right there, I don't know about you, that's weird. Um, by definition, what happens to a sacrifice? It dies. It dies. All right? And we don't even do this anymore. But like back in the Bible days, they did. They sacrificed things. So maybe not about in Paul's day, but definitely the Old Testament. They're sacrificing things. And you had this, you, you knew like, yeah, sacrifices die. That by definition, right? They die. You, right? Even for us in 2021, 2021, 2023, well, way lost. <laughs> we know sacrifices die. So what's Paul saying? Present your, your, this body, this thing, this flesh, like this, this actual thing that we live in. He says, present your body as a living sacrifice. Now, not, not to you know, make you go back to eighth grade or nothing, but look at verse that we got to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. All right, I'm going to ask you a grammar question. Is that a past, present, or future verb? You've never been asked that question in 35 years. I know. It's okay. Look at, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Is that something that you did way back then? Or is it something you're going to be doing today? Right now. Right now. Hey, way to go. Y'all get A's. He's like, yeah, it's the way you live as a Christian. You see, one of the lies is, oh, yeah, I went to church as a kid, and I gave my life to God. I'm in the club. Yep. That's not Christianity. That's that, that's that bootleg version, right? He says, real Christianity is you live your life in such a way, you present your body as a living sacrifice. You know what Jesus, how Jesus talked about this? He said, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. That's where it means to follow Christ. It's not I went to church. It's not I grew up going to church. It's not I prayed a prayer. It's I live my life for Christ. I present my body as a living sacrifice, meaning I am, I am daily, I'm daily dying to my desires, my flesh, my will, and I'm living for God. That's a living sacrifice. So how are we doing? Good. Yeah, it's hard, right? It's a whole lot easier to take that bootleg version. You're just showing up at church, right? It's a whole lot easier just to say, oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I got religion. But that's not what, that's not what the Bible's after. He says, no, no, present your body, this thing you live in. And that, I really think the reason he uses the word body is we understand that. That's like everyday normal life. So it's not just our church going. Or just some, some religious duty where it's everyday, normal, this body that we're living in, it should be a living sacrifice. Like, God, you're in charge, and I'm willing to daily die. Let's be honest, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Because the lies of this world are loud, the desires of our flesh are strong, and that's where we have to actually, the life of faith is, oh God, I'll do it your way. My, my flesh, my body is screaming for this, but I know, what, I know what it means to follow you, so I'm going what? I'm going your way. And I'm presenting my body as a living sacrifice. So let's go on in the text. It says, to present your body as a living sacrifice, and get this, holy and acceptable to God. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about holy. Um, that's not a very common word today, unless you're a holy roller. Right? Yeah. But like holiness is kind of a, we don't talk about that a lot in Christianity, but it's actually all over our Bibles. 
And the idea of holy was simply that you're set apart. Amen. You're different. If you're a Christian, you should be different. Different than what? The world. The world. Those who aren't Christian. So one of the best ways to know if you're a Christian is not just did you go to church or did you pray a prayer, but is, is your life holy? Are you set apart? Are you different than those who don't know Jesus? If you're not different, well, then the Bible's going to call into question, are you really a Christian at all? Because you're not holy. You're not set apart. And, and this is not some like weird, like holiness looks like all these rules you keep. That's not how it talks. That's not how holiness is in the Bible. It's a life that's actually just different because God's changed me. I've received God's mercy. So I no longer live as a slave to my sinful desires. The Bible actually says you're a slave to God and his desires. Mm -hmm. You do life on his terms. So your life is holy. And then it says it's acceptable to God. And I think now we're starting to, okay, that's actually what we should all want, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A life acceptable to God. Yeah. But we got to be honest. Who defines a life acceptable to God? Us or God? God. God. And that goes back to that, that fake Christianity again. We like to define Christianity and religion and faith on our terms, right? What we want. Because frankly, that's a lot easier, right? So we're like, oh yeah, like my church or my pastor or my... Who cares? What does God say? Like God has God, God wrote a book. He tells you how to live a life that's holy and acceptable to God. How you doing? That's what the life of faith is. It's like, oh, there is a God. He knows what's up. And I can either do life my own way or I can do life his way. Those are your options. It's called the life of faith. So he says, holy and acceptable to God. And then he says this, which is your spiritual worship. Or maybe one of your Bible translations might say something like, which is your reasonable service. It means the same thing. You see, we just started chapel with saints. That's good. We should do that. That's a part of spiritual worship. But you know what Jesus would say, quoting the prophet Isaiah? And, and if we're honest, we've all been there, maybe even this morning. Jesus would say, you can honor me with your lips, but your what? Heart. Your heart is far from me. Is it possible for us to be like that? <laughs> oh, man. We'd be singing this morning, and we are so far from God. Is God, is God fooled? No. <laughs> No, God, God's like, shut up, stop singing. I'm not impressed because your heart's far from me and I'm not playing that game with you, right? I mean, that's, that's how God treats our fake and phony worship. You showing up at church when your heart's far from God, you're not like, you're, God's not like, oh, well, at least you came to church today. That's not how God's operating. He's like, no, no, you're far from me. Don't play the game, right? Don't try to fool God. He says, no, no, your, your life, if, you look, if you're tracking with Romans 12, 1, your life lived in submission to God, meaning you're doing life God's way, it's called spiritual worship. Amen. That's what worship looks like. Worship is, is you and I living every day like God's actually in charge. Right. Like we actually love him, right? Um, if we claim to follow Christ, if we claim to be Christian, your life should look like it. Doesn't that just make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. The confliction comes, the, the problem comes, and we all know it. We're claiming to be Christian, faith, religious, but we're doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. And we actually know internally, we know we're hypocrites. Yeah. And so does everybody else, right? <laughs> everybody else can see it too. We're trying to lie to ourselves to make ourselves feel better, but we know that our lives are not spiritual worship. <laughs> we know it. And this can happen to the Christian too. So it can happen to the non-Christian, but it can also happen to the Christian. We're just playing the fool. We're just playing the game. We're not actually living lives of spiritual worship. But see, God is always after all of us. Does that make sense? He's after all of us. I don't care if you're in your Old Testament and your New Testament. There's these statements all over the Bible of love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Like, because that's what God's always been after. He's always been an all or nothing God. So if you love him with all your heart, then you're not going to love what he hates. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I really don't care much about California sports. All right. I'm a Chicago guy. Right. Um, 
So I do like Chicago sports. Um, so I grew up everything Chicago. Hey, what was that? Oh, come on. Come on. Um, we have feelings too. Um, so, yeah. So growing up, right, you know, we, we were Sox fans because my grandfather, um, who's with, the, who's with Jesus now, grew up going to the Old Kaminsky Park for a nickel. All right? Yeah, well, so I grew up going to Sox games. It was half price Tuesday nights. You go for like six bucks, and it was great. Um, but we hated the Cubs, all right? Because we're Southsiders. We hate the Northsiders. Yeah, we hate um, the Southsiders. Yeah, well, it's okay. Um, you'll win a World Series in 100 years. Um, <laughs> that's true. That's true. One. Um, but uh, it's okay. Um, but you know, if you have, if you're, if you, if you have any sort of fandom for a team, right? If you enjoy sports or you enjoy that rivalry, then it's going to show up somehow in your life. Like maybe it's going to show up in, in the in the hat you wear or the games you go to or just the the fun jest back and forth with people that still need to get saved. Um, <laughs> No, it, it just, it shows up because that's just life. What we love, right, it shows up in our actions. Amen. That's how God made the whole world to go around. Yeah. And then we believe this lie that, oh, I can love God and do what he hates. Yeah. You see how, it's like, that don't work in no other sphere in life. No. Anywhere. It doesn't work in, in sports. It doesn't work in my, my, my marriage. It doesn't work anywhere. And that's just God saying, yeah, I'm God. I made this whole globe to go around this way. But ultimately, I'm just proving that if you love me, you'll live like this. Your life would be a living sacrifice. So don't play this game with God. Say, I love God. I'm going to do my life however I want. You don't love God. You love sin. You love yourself. Yeah. Romans 12, 1 and 2 is saying, if you receive the mercy of God, oh, you're going to live like it. Because he has given you so much. Your response will be one of absolute love and devotion to him. So now, let's see how God explains himself. And, and uh, the best way to study the Bible is with the Bible, all right? So Romans 12, 1, I believe it is explained even in greater detail by Romans 12, 2. So let's go to Romans 12, 2, all right? We'll break this down and then we'll wrap it up. Look at what he says. So he's talked about body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, spiritual worship. And so what comes next? Don't be conformed to what? This world. Don't be conformed to this world. I think of conformed. I got a couple of little kids left at the house. Um, but back in the day, we did a lot of Play-Doh. You know what Play-Doh is? That stuff you smush in your hands. You make stuff out of it. I'm terrible at it. Uh, but um, I think of the word conformed. I think of Play-Doh. There's a, there's a, there is a mold. And it's called the world. And if, if we're not walking with Christ, we will be pressed into that worldly mold. We're not our own man. We're slaves to sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the lie. Oh, I'm my own man. Yeah, whatever. You're a slave to sin. You're just like every other sinner in the world. Mm -hmm. That we're being conformed to the world. The world is actually molding us. The world is shaping us. And he says here, if you've received the mercy of God, remember verse 1? Don't be conformed to what? The world. Don't let the world be calling the shots. Don't be looking to the world to figure out how to live life. That's conformed to the world. He says, don't be that way no more. That's how you used to be when you were a slave to sin. Right? Romans 1, 2, and 3. But you're no longer that way because you've received God's mercy. So now, your life should no longer look like the world. And I just love this because he doesn't even have to tell us what the world is. We just know it, don't we? Yeah. And if we're honest, we lie to ourselves all the time, don't we? Oh, that's not really the world. That's just, I just want to do that. No, that's the world. That's the world. We know it, right? I mean, how many of us are good at lying to ourselves? And we're great at lying to ourselves. Oh, yeah, I really need this. Yeah, whatever. No, you don't. It's just the world, and it creeps into our lives, right? And it can, it can happen. It can happen when you're broke on the street. It can happen when you're making millions of dollars. It doesn't matter where you, where you live and how you roll. It's like the world creeps in and you begin to tell yourself, oh, yeah, no, this is okay. It's like, no, no. He says, don't be conformed to the world, right? Because you've received the mercy of God. But notice what he says next. This is, and I love the contrast. Don't be conformed to the world because that's not... That's not the life of faith. That's not acceptable for those who receive mercy. 
He says, but be what? Transformed. Transformed by the renewal of your mind. One of the reasons I love uh, Union Gospel is that I know so many of the staff here, they're, they're not just trying to change bad behavior. See, that's what the world does. And, and you know, and what I mean by the world, I mean people that don't know Jesus. And there's a lot of people in the world trying to do good things. But you know what they can't do? Apart from God and his word, they can't transform the mind. They can just say, you have a bad habit, stop it. And we'll help you stop it, maybe. We'll do our best effort. But see, what God, he's not just saying stop your bad habit. He's saying, I want to transform you from the inside out. I want to make you new, right? He's to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And see, this is what happens when the gospel actually saves somebody. God goes to work to transform you. Some of you have experienced that even recently. Maybe others, you've, you've known this transformation for decades. It says, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So let me just ask a question. What has to, what has to change in order to be transformed? What has to be changed? Your mind. Your mind. mind. Right? You can't, you can't be thinking the same way. That's called the world. You see, when we think about sin, we often think about bad things we do. Right? Oh, I've got to stop doing bad things. Actually, according to this, you've got to stop thinking bad ways. Because mm -hmm. you're thinking in a certain way that's leading you down a certain path called sin. So what's the scripture saying? Be transformed where? Here. Right? Be transformed. So now, instead of thinking worldly thoughts and that produce worldly desires and worldly actions, now we're thinking God's thoughts. And it's like, oh, I don't even, I don't even want to go that way anymore. Or if I'm tempted to go that way, I know what God says. I know it's good for me because God told me what's good for me and I'll be willing to submit to him. Mm -hmm. So we're transformed by this renewal of our mind. And uh, we, we gotta, I got to be careful here because we can spend like hours. It's kind of probably what you do in your, in your classes across the way. But the renewal of your mind, I mean, that is really what God does through his word. God's word is what renews our mind, right? So why do we go back to this book all the time? Because I'm not, I can't renew your mind. Your pastor can't renew your mind. This book renews your mind. So God's renewing your mind. And it's like, whoa, I'm actually learning what God says and how to live my life on God's terms. That's called faith. And now it's all making sense, right? And now I'm actually, my mind is being renewed. And we see things like in Psalm 119 where it talks about how do we, how does a young man, old man, young woman, old woman, doesn't matter. How do, how do you keep your way clean? How do you guard your way against sin? Well, according to what? The Word of God. The Word of God is what begins to be like, oh, I know what God says, so I know how, how to live and how not to live. What's God doing? He's renewing your mind. He's transforming your mind, right? You begin to think things like, oh, hold on. God said this, and if I go down this path, it'll end up in misery, pain, and consequence. How do I know that? Well, because God said so. And God's always right, right? If I go my own way, I prove God to be true. What I mean by that is I go my own way and I suffer consequences. Any, any amens? Amen. Yeah, we, we go our own way, we suffer consequences. But you know what? You don't need experience to tell you that. God told you that. Amen. So go your own way, it'll be, it'll be painful for you. But then we also know, wow, God, if I, if I actually submit my life to you and I walk in your ways... Ooh, you call, you say, blessed is the man whose way is blameless. You call that good. Oh, okay, God. Now I'm tracking with you. This is what it looks like to walk in your ways. Mm -hmm. So he's renewing our minds. He says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And frankly, if we're honest, we just want, we just want to say, what's the list? What's the rules? Okay, don't do these three bad things. Do these three good things, and I'm better. That's not how God operates, because God's after our hearts. Amen. Remember that? You can, he says, don't, don't you just honor me with your lips when your heart's far from me. He actually wants your inner person. I want you to actually love me and live like it. So let's see what, say, what he says next, okay? He says, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, that by testing. How many of you like tests? A couple of you? Yeah, I don't. I hate tests. Um, I hated them in school. I hate him in life. 
But see, there's a God in heaven, and here's what he's saying. You don't be conformed to the world, be transformed by the your mind. And now that's all theory. That's like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, God talk, I got that. Don't be conformed, be transformed, okay. Now it gets real, real. He says, I'm going to test you. And I'm going to test you, and when you're tested, you'll actually know if you're walking in my ways. All right? So here's where it gets real. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm loving God, I'm living for God. Here's, here's, what, here's what testing looks like. You get tempted to sin. Sure. Anybody face temptations? Yeah, we all face temptations. We get tempted to do something, say something, and, and now we can say, hold on, I know what God says. I'm in a test right now. I can either do life God's way, or I can go my own way. Right? That's called a test. See, testing, what we, spiritual tests aren't just like, hey, fill out these three answers and turn it back into your teacher. That's not what God's talking about. It's the real test of everyday life. I want to go my own way. But God, you said this. And God's testing your faith. And in that moment, you actually begin to learn. And this is actually sweet men and women. I love this. In those moments when I pass the test, meaning I agree with God, I'm like, ah, oh, Lord, you're renewing my mind. You're transforming me. Because in my, in my flesh, what do I want to do? I want to sin. I want to go after the world. I don't want to walk with God. I don't want to have to die to myself. Remember that little living sacrifice thing? I hate that stuff in the flesh. And God's like, no, no, walk with me. I want you to, I want, I'm testing your faith. I'm actually testing, do you love me enough to not go after sin? And we agree with God. And we go, oh, okay, God, praise him. I passed the test. Or we fail the test because we do that too. I realize, oh, my mind is not really being transformed yet how I thought it was, right? Because it's easy to learn information. We can sit in class all day long, but real life rubber meets the road, right? That's when we see what we're made of, right? I mean, it's kind of like going to, going to practice, all right? You can, be, you, can, you can think you're a great team, right? You can, you can practice hard all day, every day until that first game, and you get crushed, right? You thought you were ready. You didn't pass the test. Right, so we can we can think, oh yeah, I'm doing good. I love God. All right, prove it when you're tested. The test proved. Do you actually love Him? Is your mind being renewed? Are you submitting to His will and His ways? Because here's the point. I love how it finishes. It says that by testing, you would discern what the will of God is. So the main point there is like we don't always know up front what's the will of God, but in that test, God's going to prove you. Oh, I'm learning. Okay, God, here's how I walk with you. I'm discerning. The will of God, and here's how, here's how that verse finishes. And we all want this. I know we all do. What is the good and acceptable and perfect? You see, the problem with that, remember how we talked about the bootleg version of Christianity? Everybody says, oh yeah, we want the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And everybody says, oh yeah, God's good will for your life. God's good plan for your life. And they just make promises without ever telling you how to get there. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells you how to get there. You want to know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life? Then Romans 12, 1 and 2 is how you get there. It's the roadmap. So you can't just be like, oh yeah, God, I want your good will for my life while I'm living like a hooligan. That's not, no, you're never going to know the good will of God for your life because you're running from the will of God, right? So he says, no, you want to know my good, acceptable, perfect will? Then you got to live like, you got to live in submission to me. You say, okay, God, what are, you, what, are, what are your ways? What do you want? Okay, God, you're testing my faith. Okay, now I'm going to respond to that test. I'm going to submit to you. And as we do that, we're like, oh, God, your ways are good. Let me give you a real, real life, simple example. I told you I have four kids. Um, you know, I think, I think God, when you're a parent, God, um, if you're willing to walk with God, God's going to grow, your, grow what I call your faith. And he's going to do it through growing your patience, all right? Because mm -hmm. kids test your patience. Mm -hmm. you, anybody agree? Amen. All right. So we got a few agreement, a few amens here. Um, so kids test your patience. So here's, here's what goes on, right? My kid, I come home from a long day, and they do something stupid because kids do, kids do stupid things. And in my flesh... Not the spirit of God, my flesh, what do I want to do? Kill them. 
I want to punish him, or maybe I just want to yell at him. I want to, I want to say, go away. I need some me time, right? I want to do me because I've had a long day, and I'm, I'm going to respond in the flesh. Now, here, remember, by the, by testing, you discern the good will of God. So now I got a test when I when I walk in the door after a long day, and then a verse comes to mind. Let's just say a soft answer turns away wrath, and now I either can agree with God. <coughs> Or I can go my own way. Now, if I agree with God and I actually put into practice what my Bible tells me to do and I work out this faith that I say I have in God. Okay, Lord, I'm not feeling it right now. I really want my, my kid to just go away. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you. A soft answer turns away wrath. I'm going to be gentle and loving. Which, which one actually produces... A better result in my home. My way or God's way? God. Every time. Every my kid don't walk away crying. Nobody's like saying, oh, stay away from dad. He's had a, he's in a bad mood. No, the, everything at our home is great. You know what I'm experiencing, man, at that moment? The good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Not because Justin's a great guy, but because I actually just I obeyed this book. I'm like, okay, God. I'm getting it. You're transforming my mind. You're testing my faith right now. And I can either agree with you or go my own way. Mm -hmm. When I go my own way, I'm not experiencing the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm -hmm. But when I do agree with you, oh, okay. I'm experiencing the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, brothers and sisters, when we claim to follow Christ, we claim to have received the mercy of God. I think the point of Romans 12, 1 and 2 is it's going to look like something. It's going to look like, I like to just call it the life of faith or life on God's terms. You're no longer your own master. Jesus is. Amen. And it's actually good. Because let's be honest, when we're our own masters, how does it go for us? Yeah. Real bad. Right? right? Real bad. But whether we believe the lie, we keep going after it. He says, no, 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 stop that. Stop going your own way. I, I've changed you. I've made you new. I've given you mercy. Now, here's what it looks like when you've received my mercy. Because you have my spirit. You have my grace. You have my word. Now live a life that actually is no longer conformed to the world, but is being continually transformed. And as you live that way, oh, you're going to know my good will for your life. Mm -hmm. You see, the problem is, is that we all want God's good will without actually living like it. Amen. And that's never going to work. If we don't live in submission to God's will and his ways, all we're going to know is pain and consequence every time. Every time. You can take it to the bank and guarantee it. It's in submission to God's will and his ways that you're going to go, oh, God, walking with you is good, right? And, and when we do live a life that's no longer conformed to the world, but is being transformed, you know we're actually proving that we love him. Yeah. That's it. We're proving we love him. We're no longer proving that we love ourselves, that we love sin. We're actually, no, no, I love God. How do you know you love God? Because I live like it, right? He's my master and I live like it. So let's pray, ask God to do that, and we'll wrap it up. Father God, we need your help to do this, Lord. It's not easy to be transformed, but you have given us your word. You've given us your spirit. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning that they would know what it means to not just know your mercy and salvation, but to know your, your mercy and transformation. Mm -hmm. That we would be people who actually live like Jesus has saved us. Mm -hmm. That we would not be conformed to this world, we'd be transformed by the renewal of our minds. So God, would you please do that to each one of us more and more and more. That we would be people that know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, not just in this book, but actually in our real experiences every day. Because it's so good to walk with you. Because you're good. And we thank you for being a good God. And in Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.